Becoming your own banker, the infinite banking concept, bank on yourself and other financial concepts promote the idea of using the life benefits of life insurance. Many people think life insurance is for when you die. That's true, but you can also use life insurance while you're still alive. heard of one of the concepts John mentioned, or another one that involves the use of cash value of life insurance, you may already know that life insurance can be a powerful financial tool. There are many benefits to using life insurance as a financial tool. The problem is there's good life insurance and there's bad life insurance. And many people who are looking for good insurance end up buying the bad. I don't know if it's primarily because life insurance agents don't understand the products they sell well enough, they don't, or if it's because they're looking to sell the highest commission, because many do. But either way, people are buying bad life insurance. We believe that you, as the customer, should understand the basics of life insurance so you don't have to buy the bad policy, because the results can be disastrous. You lose time, you can lose money, and the results are hard to undo after the free look period. And of course, when we're talking about good or bad life insurance, we're talking about the purpose of why the insurance was purchased, not the product itself. So this kind of brings us back to, you know, as we look at the purpose of life insurance, it kind of brings us back to the history of life insurance and where that came from and uh, takes us to, what is it, the Tower, Lloyd's of London, wasn't it? Uh, Tavern in England, uh, where they could, they had a great view of the harbor. And what they were noticing is some of the ships uh, set sail and never came back. And so they began to wager that uh, this ship might not come back or this ship would. And uh, it developed kind of a a pool of uh, money that uh, was played and it would would pay off the cargoes that uh, were lost and whatnot. Very unscientific. It was more speculation. Yeah, speculation. Can't you see these guys just sitting around, you know, kind of teasing each other, which one's going to come back and, and all of this. And then you know, they started noticing, hey, why, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? And, and may, I can just pick your picture some betting back and forth. And then uh, people wanting to be maybe a little bit more, uh, know a little bit more, well, I know something about this ship, or I know something that's happening at sea, or I know the weather pattern, and starting to put more science behind it. And long before that, you know, in the Roman era, the, uh, a general of the Roman army noticed that his soldiers that were killed in battles, families were left destitute. And so he pulled together money so that those families were supported if his soldier died and left a family destitute. They were not left without finances. And that pulls in more of the life insurance part of it rather than the cargo or the or the mercantile part of life of, of insurance. So you had the birth of insurance in the modern era back with the Lloyds of London type arrangements. And then here in the United States, there was a group of people that got together in 1759 and started a life insurance group. That's considered the first life insurance company. Um, Benjamin Franklin was involved in that, wasn't he? He was. Uh, after he had started the fire insurance for Philadelphia because of the uh, understanding and building fire departments all across the, the, the city, he realized that there was also a need for life insurance to help widows and orphans. Mm. And so he helped the Presbyterian Synod set up the first life insurance company in this, uh, in this country in America. Interesting. Well, now this is going away a little bit from life insurance, but it's a benefit. Um, when we lived in Nevada, we lived close to Hoover Dam, and we took a tour there. And one of the things they told us is that more people died in construction on the Arizona side rather than the Nevada side. And that seems odd until you find out the reason. Uh, when people died on the Nevada side, their buddies drug them across to the Arizona side because the benefits paid out to their families were better in Arizona than in Nevada. So it's not that more people died, but more people were recorded as dying in Arizona because they wanted the benefits for those their buddies' families. So we're talking about workman's comp insurance now, <laughs> which can cover for a life as well. So there's lots of different kinds of insurance and insurance that covers lives. What are some of the types of insurance that we see come through this office that, um, that we deal with on a regular basis? 
Well, would it be okay for me to ask you, you know, why do people buy life insurance today? today? Well, for numerous reasons. Some people buy it just to make sure that if they die, mm-hmm. then there's going to be coverage to get the daughters married, to put the kids through college, to pay the house off, maybe have a little leftover for their spouse to continue to function until they can get back in the workforce or whatever. Okay. Um, so that's so, most so commonly term family. insurance. Okay. Most commonly that's called term insurance. And a lot of people are more familiar with that. Um, but there's also a stigma of people not wanting to talk about it because they don't want to talk about death, but it happens. There's group insurance that usually is paid for by your employer or offered by your employer that you can buy for very low price, but it's only good for as long as you work for that employer. And then when you leave, the COBRA laws allow you to change that to a personal policy, but the premiums are going to be outrageous when that happens because you got it at a group rate and now you're paying it as an individual rate. So those are types of insurance that are very, very common, mm-hmm. um, uh, and most people know about those. But then we go into get into permanent life insurance products like whole life insurance, dividend-paying whole life insurance, and then we've got the universal products, the traditional universal, index universal, and, of course, the variable universal products. You can say on one hand we've got the term insurance, the temporary types of insurance, and on the other hand we have permanent insurance. That's a good Those are delineation. Have, all temporary right. and permanent. So the term insurance, most people are familiar with those different options. You have um, you have different types of it, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the COBRA stuff that you were talking about. You have one year renewable term insurance. You have level term insurance. Uh, so you have those in one bucket, but then in the permanent bucket, we have whole life insurance and some other insurances that are in there is universal life insurance, mm-hmm. indexed universal life insurance, variable universal life insurance. That would be in the permanent bucket. Should those really be in the permanent bucket, though? Well, let's break it down even a little bit further, because okay. when we're talking about term insurance, there's really two types of term insurance. There's, like you said, one-year renewable or renewable in uh, term insurance that the premium goes up every year because you're one year closer to dying, according to the actuarial tables. And so every year it gets more expensive. So a 35-year-old buying a term life insurance policy for $100,000 uh, will only pay like $117 the first year. But by the time he's 76, if he continues to have paid the premiums, he'll pay $15,000 more than what the death benefit's worth. That's significant. Yeah. That's a high cost. That becomes temporary because nobody pays those premiums. So then so, what? So that's, in the, that's in the term. Bucket. That's in the temporary. term. Okay. Now, then there's level term. And level term says, the insurance companies say, come along and say, hey, look, you know, we pro- know the probability of you dying in the next 15 years is very low. So we're going to reduce the cost of insurance, term insurance, and you'll pay a flat fee every year or every month, depending on how you break it down. And the price will not go up for that 10-year period or that 15-year period or that 20-year period, whatever the window of the term is. But then after that window expires, the premium is going to jump to where it was with one-year renewable insurance. And so you're going to see a jump from maybe $2,000 a year to $20,000 a year in one year. Nobody does that. Ouch. So now we could ask, why do people want permanent insurance? Well, because they want it to last their whole life, but also it has high cash value buildup that we can access during our lifetime. And that's what we really like. Yes. So some things that happened in the 70s and 80s was A.L. Williams came along and said, really, you should just buy term and invest the difference in the cost of permanent insurance that you would have paid if you had bought permanent insurance. And just buy this cheap term, because if you invest well, you won't need insurance by the time you get to your fifth or sixth decade in life. And that wasn't a proven fact. It was a theory. It was a theory. And it was a theory based on the fact that his father had died in his 40s and had only bought whole life insurance, permanent insurance, that had not built up enough death benefit to take care of his family. So in his family situation, there probably needed to be some term insurance as well as the permanent. Yeah. 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 And then following on the hills of A.L. Williams comes E.F. Hutton. 
<laughs> you guys oh. remember E.F. Hutton? You don't, John. It was before your time. <laughs> yes, I remember the commercials with E.F. Hutton. I remember this one. They were in a restaurant. You know, it's a busy restaurant. You hear the silverware clanking in the background and waiters rushing by and conversations going on. And uh, one of the pe people, uh, one of the tables, they're talking about financial things. And he says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And he says, and all of a sudden, Everything goes silent in the restaurant. People are leaning forward. The waiter is stopped. Uh, there's no silverware clanking, nothing. And it's just silent. And so then they say, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. <laughs> and E.F. Hutton came up with a brilliant idea. Buy term vests the difference, but the insurance should get the cut on that. So they didn't want you running out of house to invest the difference. So he developed universal life. So now the insurance company controls the, gets the profits from the investments. And, uh, and the client assumes the risk, and the client pays the premiums. And that was the ideal situation for insurance companies, and they sold many, many of those products. E.F. Hutton is no more. That brokerage firm is gone, and insurance companies have paid, paid millions of dollars to settle those claims because the premiums go through the roof because it's based on one-year renewable term insurance. That's a good point you make there. So even though universal life insurance products are in the permanent bucket, they're based on something from the temporary bucket. They are. And they're, they're pulling that high cost over into the permanent bucket, trying to make something permanent out of a temporary foundation. And here is the difference. Term insurance never becomes paid up. Now, that's an insurance term for being paid off. When you make a payment on your car, you don't make that payment again. When you make a payment on your house, you build equity in your house. You never make that payment again. You never pay interest on that portion again. That's not the case with universal life insurance products, whether it's traditional like E.F. Hutton's product or the new fangled product, indexed universal, or if it's the variable insurance. You're always paying the premium, either out of your pocket or from the proceeds of the investment. You're missing that ownership element. In whole life insurance, you don't buy term insurance unless some agent blends it into the product. Okay. You're buying base insurance, and base insurance is like a mortgage. Every time you make a payment on it, you own a little bit more of it, and you never make a payment on that portion again. It is permanent. You own it. And if you surrender it, the insurance company has to refund the money that you paid for that. So that has the true ownership aspect in the permanent bucket. You want that whole life insurance. Very interesting. Whole life insurance is the only insurance product that was consumer driven. That means it was demanded by the consumers that they wanted equity in something that they were purchased from the insurance company, not just the promise that someone would pay out a lot of money when they died. So oftentimes we'll hear, you know, that people will say, well, whole life insurance, that's an old product. You know, even though it's good, you know, yeah, but it's old. The indexed universal life insurance, they found ways to design it now that are better. So it can, it can actually be better than whole life anymore. That's a, that's a phrase we often hear, better than whole life, like it, but better. Why is that not true? Well, it comes down to the risk factor. Life insurance should not have the person purchasing it assume the risk. The only risk that the, the policyholder should have is to pay the premiums because the whole purpose of life insurance in the first place, or any insurance, is indemnification. You want someone else to take the liability for something that could or will happen in the future. And so um, assuming that risk is what happens in universal products. The policyholder assumes that risk. The insurance company assumes nothing. So we have to look at who is promoting this. So that reminds me of the study you did years ago, or not that you did, but that you read about years ago, where they said potatoes and potato chips are just as nutritious. Or the, <laughs> <laughs> they have equal nutrition, but then you looked at, well, who did this study? And it was Frito-Lay. You know, it, so it they may say that universal life is better uh, you know, than potatoes. But who did the study? <laughs> Better than the whole life insurance, but yeah. who's doing this study? Yeah. And w let's look at the facts. What are the guarantees of the policies? What are we really seeing here? 
because well, we know potato chips aren't more nutritious than potatoes. We can take potatoes and we can do lots of different things with them. But if we've got to rely on one or the other, we want to rely on the potatoes. Yeah. Well, I want to just bring up one thing about index universal life insurance, and then let's jump to the good type of insurance mm -hmm. that is good for the infinite banking concept and things like that. I'm holding here in my hand um, an illustration from an IUL, an indexed universal policy that's about 12 years old. The gentleman now is 47 years old, and the cost of his insurance is 22 cents, 22282 exactly, per thousand dollars of insurance per month. They make these tables really simple to read. So, okay. so you have, <laughs> ha, have ha, this ha. decimal number that then you have to multiply by how many ever thousand dollars of insurance is there, and that tells you what the cost of insurance and is. Per month, and then per you month. have to multiply okay. by 12 to find out what it's going to cost you per year. Not the easiest thing in the world, but we can follow that. So this is 12 years into this policy. For $1,000 of coverage, he's paying $2,675 a year for so he's already paying more than what the death benefit is going to be in this policy. Wow. By the time we go out 40 years, when he's 86, the time that most American males pass, he's going to be paying $109,722 for that same $1,000 of coverage. Ooh. Now, what they're speculating is, is that the index that this policy is mirroring is going to make up the difference in those premiums. Mm. The sad part is it rarely ever does. I don't think it ever does. We've never heard of a case that does. That's why when you look at a universal life insurance illustration, you see those values go down to zero. They usually the disappear after about the surrender fee time that is off the policy because the insurance company wants that policy to be paid for at least 12 or 15 years. So they guarantee certain values so that it'll last that long and people will keep paying the premiums. But then after that, the guarantees pretty much disappear. So when we want life insurance that can be useful for infinite banking, what, are, what type of policy are we looking for? We're looking for a policy that typically is sold through a mutual company. It doesn't have to be, but normally it is because we want it to participate in the profits of the company. Another way of saying that is we want the policy to be subject to earning dividends. We want the policyholder to actually have ownership of the company. And that is really cool. I mean, even stocks that pay dividends are preferred over other stocks because it's like a bonus at the end of the year. Um, whatever the board of directors decides that that dividend is going to be for that year, that's just an added bonus to what you earned in, in the uptick or whatever position you held in the market. Same as with a whole life insurance policy that is earning dividends. When the company is profitable, and these companies have consecutively been profit profitable for over 100 years, some of them over 150 years now, then they share those profits with the policyholders that are participating owners of the company. And that's what participating whole life insurance means. Now that you have a basic understanding of how life insurance works, we want to give you the keys so that you know how to get a good life insurance policy and how to tell a good policy from a bad policy. We'll cover that right after the break. Did you ever play with a set of these rings growing up? They make a great visual picture of how you should set up your finances. On top, you have the higher risk investments, the lower risk investments. This ring is debt, this ring is savings, and this ring is protection. This stand represents the economy. If there's one thing we know about the economy is that it will change, and it does, and this can change. It's unstable. What some people do when they set up their finances, they take and they go for the shiny, high risk, potentially high yield investment. Now potential return does not mean probable and it is definitely not probable. So this doesn't perform as well as they hope and they think they should add a more conservative investment that actually might return something. So they add that and believe it or not, some people will go into debt for that. Add that to the debt they already have and there's their debt ring right on top of that. If you are listening to this podcast, I hope that you have time to click the link in the description for the YouTube video and we'll tell you where in that video you can see this demonstration. 
demonstration because it really comes alive when you see it. Well, you have these three negatives, these investments that aren't returning as well as you had hoped and your debt, which is just a draw on your finances. And people think, oh, I should probably save something. So they add savings to that. Then they look at what they have going there. It looks a little precarious. So they plop some protection right on top of that. Well, if there's one thing we know about the economy is that it will change. It is uncertain and unstable. And as soon as it changes, you lose your protection and your savings, which are the two things you want to keep most. That's the importance of doing it right. Start with protection. That makes a nice foundation for everything else you do financially. Once you have protection in, then add your savings program so you can keep more of the money you make. Next, make sure your debt is handled. Pay off the bad debts, keep the good debt. A good debt is one that gives you a tax advantage or limits your opportunity costs and allows you to make money. Once that's handled, you can do an investment. Hopefully this is something you know about because those type of investments that you know something about tend to return better. And if you have extra cash flow and want to go for one of those potential high risk, high reward investments, then you can do that too. Now, when the economy changes, you're much more secure. At McPhee Insurance, we specialize in helping people set up this layer, the protection layer, the foundation for what they do financially. We specialize in designing and selling whole life insurance that becomes this protection layer for you. It's a good foundation for everything else you do financially. If you need life insurance, or if you need to get a life insurance policy already unreviewed, we can help you with both of those things. Contact us by phone at 702-660-7000, or you can email us, team at mcfeeinsurance.com. How do you know if a policy is good or bad? Well, we always have to look at the purpose of why the insurance is needed or desired. And then once we know that, we can determine whether this policy fits the need then it's a good policy. If it doesn't fit the need, it's a bad policy. It doesn't matter what the product is. Okay, so I bring you a policy that I want to use for infinite banking. Is this okay. a good policy? It depends. Now we're looking for what are the guaranteed cash values and how fast do they grow and what other riders have been put onto this policy that might diminish the guaranteed value growth in that policy. So we're also looking at what are the guaranteed values compared to the amount of premium you're paying. Absolutely. So how much are you having to pay to get those guaranteed values? Is it a good balance? How soon will the premiums paid be less than what your guaranteed cash values are? We want that to happen mm -hmm. sooner than later because if you're wanting to use this policy for the infinite banking concept, you want to start getting into managing that money pretty quick. So I was looking at a policy the other day on a 35-year-old preferred health paying, let's say, a premium of starting $20,000 a year for the first seven years, and then it decreases. Got 65% cash value of, of what's pay, paid in premium the very first year. By year five, the cash value is growing faster than the premium that's paid every year. By year 11, the guaranteed values are higher than what's the total of all the premiums that have been paid oh, for wow, a policy. That, is that's... that a good policy for infinite banking? That's a great policy for infinite banking. Now, what some other people will do is they'll say, hey, look, you know, we can get you 90% of cash value in the oh, first year. Oh, yes. A 90-10. <laughs> you hear that. We that sounds exciting. About that. And when we look at that, what they've done is they snuck in a piece of term insurance. It's called a term rider. That stuff that goes up in mm -hmm. price, you know, they put that in there. And now what that does, term insurance never, ever converts to paid up insurance. And so it's a cost that drags down the internal rate of return of the guaranteed values in that policy for the rest of its life. Yeah, you get to use the money, but you had 100% of the money before you put it in the policy. It doesn't make sense to get a 90-10 policy unless maybe you're older and you think you're going to die within that time the term policy writers on that policy. So using an example from before the break, I can, I could say, well, you know, potatoes and potato chips are just as nutritious. I'm just going to be eating a serving of potato chips every time I want potatoes. And that seems quick and easy. All you have to do is open the bag. They are ready. But in the long run, my health is going to suffer. Yes. And so that's the same thing that's happening when a term writer is put on a policy just to get higher cash values initially. Um, th that's nice for now, but it's going to create a drag later on. And um, it's really not going to serve the long-term purpose that we have. That's right. You pay end up paying more for the term insurance if it's blended in with a whole life product. You end up paying more for the base. 
And all it allows you to do is dump more money into the paid up writer of the policy, which is building the cash value. So it's not conducive to keeping more money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. It's conducive to the agent that's selling it. And then also we have to have the words always and never. You can't always, <laughs> you can't ignore always and never. Um, there is an occasion where we might use the term writer, but it's very rare and only under certain conditions. It's just like you can have potato chips, but don't make them the chief of your diet. Well, if and you have to know to us, the purpose. If someone comes to us with a bad policy and they want to roll that into a new policy, sometimes it might be necessary to put a term writer on there to get all that money from the old policy into the new one without creating a tax liability. For exactly. Them. Yeah. So there are purposes. So we never say never, but overall, a term writer is not in your best interest. I know one of the things when you look at a policy, you're looking to see if you're looking at guaranteed values or non-guaranteed values. How do you tell the difference when you're looking at it in an illustration? Well, in an illustration, they're just side by side. In a policy- In a whole life illustration. Yeah. In a policy that is issued, they split them apart. Okay. So sometimes people get confused about that, but on an illustration, they're just side by side. And you can look, oh, this is the guarantees. And that means it's a contract. If you pay this premium, that cash value will be there, whether it's your three or four or age 90. And they, they have a yeah. header over it. Mm -hmm. It'll say guaranteed values. And then on the other side, they'll have non-guaranteed values or non-guaranteed assumptions, something like that. So you, you'll you be able to tell by looking at the heading what it's what it's saying. And some okay. some people call that guaranteed cash surrender value rather than guaranteed cash values, mm -hmm. because that's really what it is. It's what you would get if you surrendered the policy. Okay. Okay. Over on the other side, the non-guaranteed side, usually on the right side of the page, then you have something called dividends. Or in a universal product, you're going to have, oh, we speculate we'll earn 4% interest on this, or we speculate you could earn 6% on this. And they'll present those values. So those are speculative gains. Okay. They're not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. They can't be because nobody knows the future. We always look at the guaranteed values because that's what we know we will have. Because even if the insurance company we buy the policy from can't match those guarantees that they promised contractually, then the insurance commissioner in every state will find another company that will honor that contract. Okay, And that's happened over and over in history where a company can't quite match their guarantees. So the insurance commissioner comes in and says, okay, you've got to bring up enough capital so that you can, or we're going to force the sale of this to this other company that already does. So it's it's regulated at the state level there. It's the not, state not level. the feds coming in, telling the insurance company what, what to do, which is kind of nice. And then of course, there is also the, the, the self-regulatory part of insurance where they have a guarantee pool that every insurance company that sells life insurance in the United States automatically contributes to with every policy that's sold that will back up if no company is found. And that has only happened one time in American history that I know of. So we've talked about when we do a policy review, we're looking for, uh, we're comparing the cash value to premiums paid. We're looking at how fast cash value builds up. Um, we're looking at, you know, we do look at the death benefit too. And we've talked about looking at the guaranteed values. You're not talking about looking at the non-guaranteed values. Um, so in, in the non-guaranteed values are based on dividends. So do you want to talk a little bit about why we're not looking at that so much? I think what some clients say after we explain the difference between guaranteed and non-guaranteed values, they realize that the guarantees are the cake and the non-guarantees are the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. It might look fancy. It might have a bunch of flowers and decorations on it and little whistles and bells, but it's the guarantees that matter. And with many universal policies, whether it's indexed or traditional, those guarantees are zero after the, mm -hmm. the, the period where they guarantee it will not lapse if you don't pay your premium. So the guarantees are the cake. The dividends are the icing on the cake. 
But uh, when people understand how they can use the cash value of the life insurance during their lifetime, well, now we're putting filling into the cake or having ice cream alongside the cake and maybe several scoops of it uh, because we're learning how to double dip on those on the, the premiums we pay to give us cash value, and we can use our more, money more than once. In fact, is Nelson Nash, the author of The Infinite Banking Concept and How to Become Your Own Banker, used to ask me, how many times have you used your dollar, Tom? Once? And that's all I can say, because I always went to work, spent it, and had to go back to work. With The Infinite Banking Concept, you get to use that dollar over and over and over and over again, just like banks do. And that's why it's called the infinite banking concept. A lot of people confuse the fact that the policy is your bank. It is not. The policy is your depositor that deposits into you. And you become the banker that manages that money like a bank. And however well you manage it or don't manage it will depend on the volume of interest you can create. What is the difference when we're talking about life insurance? What is the difference between cash value and death benefit? That's a good question that is asked many times. And with universal life products, the selling feature of those is you get both when you die. Well, you don't get either when you die. Someone else gets <laughs> it. But the overpayments that are made in universal life just to keep it alive so that there's something to earn interest is your money. So you better get it back or your heirs better get it back when you die because it doesn't belong to the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And the death benefit is then in addition to that. In a whole life policy... The cash value represents the amount of the death benefit you have completely purchased and paid for and never will pay a premium on again. It's kind of like a, what you would get if you surrender, uh, almost like a refund. If you turn that policy back in, what the insurance company will have to refund you because that's the value of what the death benefit that you've totally paid for is worth. So it's equity. It's equity. Yeah. It's the only pop product in the insurance world that develops equity. So then the dividends become the icing on the cake. They add to the, whatever is the guaranteed foundation that is there, create the non-guaranteed values, and that kind of covers all the different elements that are go at work in a life insurance policy. We could get more complex. We can keep it simple, and oftentimes it's better to keep things simple. If you still have an outstanding question about life insurance, you can ask your question on the comments section on this podcast or reach out to us at McPhee Insurance. Life insurance is what we do, and we are always happy to help you. When you have the proper protection in place, the next item on your financial stack is savings. Next week, we talk about all things savings and how you can keep more of the money you make right here on Wealth